All right, gentlemen, are you guys ready? How many we got? Uh, seven more in the waiting room. We are officially live on Facebook and we are now recording. So I'm going to admit everybody into the meeting. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another one of our energy savings webinar series with Centurion Technologies. Um, we have a really exciting um, speaker with us today. He's an industry thought leader. Um, he has a lot of knowledge that he's bringing to the table, and we're excited to have this opportunity available to all of you. I apologize. I'm a little bit under the weather, so I sound ridiculous right now. I'm not going to talk a whole bunch. So I just wanted to let you know that you can use the chat feature um, and ask any questions, and we will make sure that we ask the presenter to answer those in a timely fashion, or we'll hold those to the very end. Thank you again. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Craig Kuchball. Um, he's the one who's making these possible. So good morning, Craig. Good morning, Ashley. And thank you for helping us out with that. You're invaluable when it comes to us. Today, uh, folks, we have uh, definitely a leader in the energy seminar in the energy space and sustainability space, Mark Fiesel, who is uh, senior as a senior guy at Fuel Cell Energy. Mark comes to us from Schneider Electric and has quite an impressive resume. So without further ado, um, again, I want to thank you all for joining us. Um, I'm going to introduce Mark Fiesel and let him take it away and uh, educate us with all his knowledge on a fuel cell. Thank you very much. That sounds great. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Ashley. Happy to be here this morning or wherever you're at time wise. Uh, and um, yeah, so uh, nice to nice to meet everyone. I, we've got about 20, like 25 slides. So we should have some time for some Q&A uh, at the end and happy to really dig in. Um, just a little bit about myself, uh, Chief Commercial Officer at Fuel Cell Energy. And so what that means is um, essentially accountable for engaging with uh, our current and prospective customers and really talking about what energy means to them, what it means to their business, what it means to their employees, what it means to their shareholders, and then try to co-create um, a solution that aligns to their needs. And whether that's cost or even access, sustainability, resilience, really addressing and thinking about all those things. Um, as Craig mentioned, my background, I've been in energy really all my life. I'm a Began my career in the, the U.S. Navy, um, nuclear nuclear submarine guy, and then uh, a little over 20 years with Schneider Electric. And I'm proud to have been here at, at Fuel Cell for uh, just about two years coming up in April. So um, I've had a chance to see uh, a lot of different kinds of energy and implications on grids and implications on loads and buildings. And uh, I think uh, happy to engage in some dialogue today in which we we pull some of those together. I'll be focusing a little more today on on hydrogen, but we'll touch upon carbon capture. We'll touch upon other elements and happy to address the wider energy landscape uh, in uh, the Q&A sessions or even afterwards. So why don't we begin with the story of what energy energy transition means and um uh, this is a slide I put this together. I beyond working at Fuel Cell, I'm also an adjunct professor um, in Northwestern's master's degree program in energy and sustainability. And so this is a slide I put together for our students entering that course, and um, begins with the story of fossil fuels. And you know, for for hundreds and thousands of years, humans have been using fossil fuels to do the the fundamental and important things that we require to keep us alive. Right? We need light. We need heat. We need to cook, uh, cook food, and uh, fossil fuels are able to do all of those things, right? But not without some challenges, right? So the mechanism by which we use those fossil fuels historically has been combustion. And when you combust these fossil fuels, you get some side effects. And those side effects can, can be particulate matter and gases like ozone, NOx, SOx, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, volatile organic compounds. These are things that um, can either damage people. Um, and so if you think back uh, into the into the 1960s and 70s, for those of you even around, you might have been 
thinking about or hearing about words like smog and acid rain. And, and nowadays we're hearing a lot about climate change. These are all elements and manifestations of of the the implications really of of using fossil fuels uh, via combustion and, and some of these things that you get. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how we're moving away from some of these things, but let's begin with the story of of things we've been talking about a lot. This, you know, aren't there other ways of of creating energy, right? And 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 so there there are there are indeed some non combustion and zero carbon replacements for these. So I just highlighted three of them: nuclear wind and 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 uh and solar and indeed they do create energy but the challenge if i go back to those fundamental elements of light heat and cooking uh they don't do a great job at that right as i mentioned i spent uh i spent uh i did eight patrols on a nuclear submarine i didn't you know want to use the reactor uh <laughs> directly to uh to, to cook my food or to provide light in a room and and a wind turbine doesn't light up a room very well by itself etc and so while they create energy, um, it's difficult to have them actually substitute some of those functional needs that we need out of, of combusting fossil fuel, which, of course, is what, you know, the beauty and advent uh, of the grid brought to us. Right. So the grid uh, bulk power grid that's you know been in operation uh, here in the U.S. for over a century has allowed us to bring together different sources of generation and indeed to substitute some of these newer sources that don't result in some of those bad things on the left um, and, and can fulfill some of those needs. Uh, the challenge, of course, though, is that those energy sources on the right, they have their own kind of unique set of, of challenges. They Wind and solar can be intermittent in nature. They're not always online. Uh, they can't be completely dependent upon to provide power at all times. Nuclear power can operate continuously, but it's very difficult to cite, you know, probably reading stories about small modular reactors and, and things like this. So who knows what, what some of it looks like in the future, but very difficult to use that energy locally. So in addition to the grid, um, we've got to have some things that help these things operate better within this environment. And these are the enablers. And these enablers are where we're going to spend quite a bit of time today. Um, I'm going to reference three of them. There's more of them, but carbon capture, um, the mechanisms by which we can capture the CO2 associated with combusting fossil fuels or extracting energy from fossil fuels, a mechanism to allow us to continue to use those while we ramp up uh, implementations of those things on the right. The story of hydrogen substitution. How might we think about using hydrogen today where we're, we're using fossil fuels? Uh, and in doing so, create an environment which we don't get all those negative things on the left, nor do we get CO2 um, that results in climate change. And then finally, energy storage. So when we think about this intermittency, when we think about creating a grid that is reliable, energy storage uh, is a key component. Now, when you see the, see the word energy storage, a lot of people go immediately to lithium ion. And indeed, lithium ion is, a, is an important part of our grid and, and uh, a key enabler for what we're doing, but it's not the only kind of storage. Indeed, there are thermal storage, there's hydrogen storage, there's all kinds of things that, that go into this broader concept of storage. And we'll touch a little bit upon those during our conversations today. So using this as a framework, let's, let's go ahead and dig in a little bit. And I think it's helpful to, to think about how energy changes because you may look at those things on the, you know, that we're on the right and say, hey, um, great news. Now, don't we have wind and solar? We've got this grid in place. You know, should, you know, shouldn't we immediately be turning off all of our coal plants tomorrow? And I think it's helpful to look back and say, how has this transition happened over time? And, and so uh, let's just kind of go through some key dates. Way back in 1859, oil was struck in, uh, in, 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 in Titusville. Now, looking at this, this illustration, just pay attention to some of the colors. So, um, on the bottom is uh, the brown, which is traditional biomass. So, of course, in the very beginning, we're using peat and we're using wood to go and create light and heat and things like that, or even whale blubber, et cetera, uh, in, in, in uh, homes and businesses to create the things that are needed. Uh, oil happens, strike happens in 1859. And, you know, you might think, well, gosh, wouldn't that immediately, you know, begin to result in a scenario in which oil is 
is becoming a more key part of our uh, energy mix. And of course, if you pay attention to that light red color, you'll see no. In fact, it wasn't until all the way out in, you know, close to 1920, when indeed oil began to creep up into that energy mix. If you think about, we'll talk about this as we go, but what makes it take so long? Well, first of all, there wasn't any kind of long distance pipeline. So it's one thing to have oil in the ground and finding it, but it can be quite expensive and time consuming and and, uh, and and laborious and dangerous to get that oil from where it is to where it's needed. So a mechanism of conveyance was really important to make that happen. You also needed something that would use that oil or use it very efficiently. And of course, we think back to Henry Ford, uh, and that's right around that time period. So the combination of the mechanism of conveyance and a new and incremental utilization for that was key uh, to really ramping that up. But in that case, um, literally 60 some years before oil finding to when it became a significant part of the energy mix. Let's talk about natural gas, right? Natural gas pipeline from the Gulf Coast, Pennsylvania to New York was completed. Notice that really ties into when you start to see purple, which is natural gas begin to take off. The truth was natural gas came out of the ground when oil was struck in Titusville. Those two things come out together, but it didn't become a significant part of the energy mix until we could get it to where we needed. Let's continue with another kind of story, nuclear power. First nuclear reactor was connected to the electric grid. Everybody thinks it's U.S. It wasn't. It was in uh, what was the Soviet Union at the time. Uh, but uh, you'll look at to the pace of which nuclear power um, has has taken off. That that's that green color that's right above natural gas. And clearly, it's gotten a little larger since 1954, but honestly, not that big. Um, nuclear power creates electricity, which can be conveyed using the same wires as other energy sources. But yet there's personal and policy preferences that can get in the way of these taking off. So you can have a great source of energy. You can have a mechanism to convey it. But if people prefer not to use it because they're afraid of it, or don't want it sitting next to them because they're scared what it does to property values, that can keep these things down as well. Let's go up to the next one. First utility scale wind farms, 1980. So now we're moving up into uh, a darker, you know, those darker colors you can begin to see towards the top. Uh, 1981, first solar goes into uh, operations. Um, but if you look up all the way up to 2021, you'll notice that those colors are sm so small you can barely see them. And so even those have those have been in uh, operation for that period of time, the truth is they haven't taken a huge bite out of the global energy consumption yet. And we're gonna be spending our time today kind of focusing on why that is and um, you know what are those things getting in the way? How are, how are things happening to go and address that? And so what you can expect over the next 20 some years. Let's dig into those time periods a little bit. Um, oil, it took 60 years to get from viable production impact on energy. Gas, 90 years. Wind, it's been over 40 years. We're still not there yet. Solar, it's been over 40 years, still not there yet. What are those things that get in the way of it making a difference? Capital costs to go do it. Um, conveyance, can you get whatever it makes from one place to another? How good of a substitute is it for the existing sources? How scalable is it? Societal attributes, do I do I like it? Does society like it or favor it? And finally, policy, both carrots and sticks. So what, what's uh, incentivizing it? What's holding it back? These are the things that really impact energy transition. So what does 2050 look like? So this is a, U, a view from the US Energy Information Administration. They do report every two years. In fact, the new report, I think just came out about a month ago, but this is data from 2021. Uh, and so it probably doesn't surprise you that you don't see, well, you know, if you read the news or listen, you might think, oh, my God, coal's going to be dead. There'll be zero coal in 2050. Um, there'll be nothing but solar and wind. Natural gas is dead. Right. You might you might come to some strange conclusions, um, but of course it won't be. And it goes back to the the chart we, we just spent the last slide looking at in that a lot of things have to come together in order for new energy sources to really begin to make a difference. Now, the good news is we do see some growth, renewables clearly um, growing quite a bit over that time period. But even over the next, what, 30 years roughly, renewables will go from 15% to only 27%. 
coal will still be a major part of that mix. Petroleum and natural gas as well. Um, nuclear, although it is zero carbon and there is some momentum around it, it's difficulty in citing uh, in other aspects still still keeps it from growing at a, as fast as the rate as maybe some of those other renewables. So when I look at this, what I think about is I always try, try to take a pragmatic view around energy in that, um, you know, what is the environment which we as a society are going to be working on? Um, how do we address and how do we be realistic about what energy sources will be here? If we're going to still live in a world in which there's a lot of coal, there's a lot of petroleum, uh, natural gas, how do we make the best of that? How do we remove those negative attributes to the extent we can as we at the same time really think about how to super accelerate renewables and other zero carbon non-combustion sources? So that's kind of the story of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, I think a really helpful context is what, how do you actually move energy forward? And this applies not just to energy, but, but a lot of things. Three things have to work in concert. Um, let's maybe start at, at, at technology. You know, is it possible to do something? Uh, can you create electricity at a rate that is competitive with other sources? Um, can you do it at large enough scale, um, et cetera? So some huge advances going on in the technology world. I listed two of them, electrochemistry. I'm in the electrochemistry world. Um, digitalization, I spend a lot of time in the digital worlds. But of course, there's also innovation right now. A lot of semiconductor stuff driving solar costs down. There's um, you know, nuclear, other things that are happening. So technology is happening. We can't do all things at all times yet. We can't scale everything today. You might read a lot about fusion or small modular reactors or other things that sound really cool, but we haven't quite figured out how to do them at the right cost or deliver it at the right kind of scale. Um, but technology is not enough alone. It, you know, if I think about, maybe I'll skip down to policy for a second. Am I allowed to do something? Am I incentivized to do something? Am I penalized for doing something else? Um, if I'm not allowed to do something, it doesn't matter if my technology works or if some sort of of uh, of, of of penalty makes it so I'm not financially attractive, then it doesn't matter that I can do it. People won't embrace it. So technology and policy have to be aligned to be able to drive some of these things. And the third element, the, the, the third gear in this illustration that has to align is business model. Uh, if people can't make money and employ people by doing these things, the market's not going to happen. So you've got to have mechanisms that are going to allow technology companies to make money, service operators, employ people, create an economy around these things. Two uh, key kinds of business model innovation that has been occurring. Deregulation now for some period of time, you may have heard about that for decades now. There was a lot of deregulation of what has been a monopolistic energy industry uh, over the last century. Um, it's been fits and starts. You may recall a lot of deregulation in the 80s and it stopped in the 90s and some people on the phone or on the call here probably probably remember why we had a little challenge with uh, Enron and market manipulation, other things that that said people had to step back a second and said, "Do we really are we really sure we're ready to turn over the keys to private industry on this stuff?" Um, you know, now back moving again pretty well, uh, but then new business models like energy as a service, where companies come in and essentially transfer risk away from the energy consumer to people that can handle that risk better. In the world of energy, there's lots of risk. Energy is invisible, it's dangerous, it travels at the speed of light. There's moving equipment, you're conveying dangerous molecules, all kinds of things. These aren't necessarily risk that everyone you know, should be prepared to take. Energy as a service helps transfer those risks off to people that will put systems in place to manage those important things. We're not gonna talk a ton about that today, but it's definitely a topic you should be aware of. Policy, there's a lot, lot of policy that impacts it. I'm going to just touch upon a few things. Uh, the Clean Air Act, um, that was put in place in 1970. It's been adjusted, I think, several times since then. And um, it was really designed to go attack um, those things that I listed on that first slide, those criteria emissions, so that knocks and socks and particulate matter, those things that were causing smog and acid rain and all these kinds of things. So that was a, a seminal piece of legislation that's impacted energy transition. Two newer pieces of legislation 
I'll focus on right now and, and, and they're beginning, just beginning now to have an impact on it. The first is the Inflation Reduction Act. I won't read this slide to you. I'll be releasing these slides. So you can read them all later. The important thing to know that this is an extremely important piece of legislation that is going to influence energy policy. It does it in a lot of ways. It's going to incentivize the production of green hydrogen to quite a bit, to, to, to an amount that will eventually facilitate the substitution of hydrogen for what today we're using natural gas and other things. So a big and important part was the hydrogen subsidy. You might hear the word 45V. That's when people are, you know, policy wonks are using uh, provision names. But 45V is the hydrogen production credit. Uh, if you can't sleep one night and go and, and, and read about what that is in the RA. Um, there's also energy credits that continue to, um, it's a carrot that is allowing people to take a tax incentive if they're using, in this case, like a fuel cell. Um, there's provisions around energy storage. Uh, you can see um, all kinds of different things, a carbon, uh, uh, carbon sequestration credit. Uh, so this is yet another part of the IRA that is going to incentivize the capture of CO2. So that's for the policy wonks 45Q <laughs> uh, and then several other credits. So many of these things can work together to be able to significantly subsidize certain types of solutions, while at the same time, things like the Clean Air Act and other things penalize other things going on. So the combination of that carrot and stick are, are things that are really indeed driving this market forward. It's why you see renewables you know, going up uh, at, at the pace. Um, and I see there's a question. Yes. Yeah. I was going to read it for you if that's okay. Is that what you yeah. uh, um, There was a okay. question. Sure, go ahead, Ashley. Through, and it's, it said, what is the timeline for government funding to be released the from the Inflation Reduction Act for green hydrogen projects? Well, it's happening right now. Um, we announced two weeks ago uh, a transaction in which 45V, so the hydrogen production tax credit that was in the IRA, coupled with the investment tax credit was monetized on a project, which happened to be a project we're going to discuss later on today, which is the Port of Long Beach tri-generation um, platform that makes hydrogen uh, and power and water. Uh, so it's already being monetized today. Now, I'm going to answer the question behind this question in that because this is tax policy, it isn't, um, it's not trivial to completely understand who can take credit and how and when and how will you get paid. So in fact, when we're able to get that credit already being put in place, uh, we had to go and um, get input from very, you know, various tax entities. And we actually had to also buy a recapture insurance policy, which means if for whatever reason, and somebody was not translating this tax policy right, that this insurance policy would make up the difference. So deals are proceeding now uh, based upon these tax credits. Uh, I think people, savvy people are probably, you know, buying recapture insurance and things like that to make sure everybody stays whole throughout this process. Um, it's a function of complex and arcane tax law. And so, yes, there are questions. And yes, you're probably going to have to hire expensive tax lawyers to, to make sure you get the right answer. But things are beginning to move. All right, let's move on. Hang back. Talk about one more piece of legislation. Um, this is good neighbor. Um, it really harkens all the way back to those criteria mittens in the in the uh, Clean Air Acts. Um, but there are specific industries and states that are coming under increased scrutiny because of the, nit the, the nitrous oxides emissions that they're creating. So I won't go into it now, but you can look up what NOx emissions do to humans and there's all kinds of issues. This is something that, that, that causes, um, causes a lot of different challenges. And so it's something that, and right now, now we're not talking about oh, 20, 30 years from now, we're talking about problems with people that live in the vicinity of some of these NOx emitting elements. And so you can see what some of the target industries are so pipeline transportation of natural gas so specifically combustion or uh, compression activities kilns cement 
uh, furnaces and uh, iron and steel, glass furnaces, different kinds of boilers, and different kinds of incineration. So these are things that are creating a lot of these knocks. They're specifically targeted. Um, these are some information around it. You can see that in some states, they're only covering power plants. In other states, they're only covering industries. But in most states, they're covering both power plants and industries. And this is one of those things that's a stick. It's not an incentive, but if you do not comply with these, if you're in one of those industries or if you're in a power production or for utility in one of these states, then you are subject. And you can see Ohio, which I think we got many Ohio people on the call today and Kentucky people, um, you are both, both power plants and industries in both those states. So like all pieces of legislation, this is being contested. I think it's going to be go all the way Supreme Court. But if this stands, significant penalties for people in those key industries, so pipeline, glass, cement, steel, boilers, <coughs> power generation, um, and uh, knocks are going to have to be managed. So this is one of those things that end up being a key driver. There's a lot of other policy out there. I'm not going to go into it now, but I wanted to highlight those three things because I talked about policy, business model, and technology have to come together. I'm going to focus on technology that addresses things like NOx, addresses things like CO2, and addresses things like creating hydrogen in order to substitute for some of these other fossil fuels. So let's dig into hydrogen. Why hydrogen is so important? Well, first of all, you know, it's every fossil fuel that, that's used is made up of hydrocarbons, and that means that you've got some hydrogen and you've got some carbon in some kind of chemical chain. In this case, CH4. So you chemistry people out there probably know that's methane. So that's natural gas. That's actually within natural gas, there's various gases, but but methane is a, is, is a key gas. And, and uh, so if uh, when we're talking about the world of, of fossil fuels, we're talking about hydrogen. Um, ammonia. So 45% um, of all the world's food today uh, is, uh, is, 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 is facilitated by a fertilizer, ammonia. And uh, of course, hydrogen plays a key role in that. That's nitrogen, one nitrogen atom plus three hydrogen atoms into this molecule. Of course, water, right? H2O. So hydrogen is at the middle, the very center of this energy, food, and water nexus. As we begin to create hydrogen, um, we can think about greening these different in industries. We can think about synthetic fuels and synthetic fertilizers, and we can think about using the hydrogen that's in water to create green, uh, you know, to create uh, green hydrogen for use in other sources. So very key. How do you, you know, where's hydrogen made today? Uh, there are a couple mechanisms. One mechanism is called a direct process. And in fact, most hydrogen today is made from something called steam methane reformation, SMR. So it's a direct process. How it works, as you can see, methane, CH4, is fed into this device along with water. There's some purification things that happen. It turns out you don't want to put really nasty fuels in there. You end up belching uh, those other criteria emissions. So you end up putting more socks and things like that into the fuel. So there's some cleanup that happens. Then this process, the steam reformation process happens. In that process, the hydrogen is separated from the um, carbon. The carbon forms carbon monoxide. The hydrogen forms water and and um, and hydrogen. Um, there's a process then that you don't want to just emit carbon monoxide. That's another one of those criteria emissions. So something called a water shift gas reaction has to happen. That shifts the carbon into carbon dioxide. So at the end of the day, um, you put methane and water in, and you end up with hydrogen and CO2 out. And then you get some you get some water left that is left as condensate. Then a final process happens in which you separate those things. This is how we make most hydrogen today. So today, the two largest uses for hydrogen, one is within petrochemical facilities. It's used for a lot of cracking applications. The second is fertilizer applications, making that ammonia. So tons of hydrogen. Some people think, oh, hydrogen's a new thing. Hydrogen's not a new thing. A lot of hydrogen is made today. But it's used this process. This is a gray process. You're putting methane in. You're getting a whole bunch of CO2 out in addition to the hydrogen. So um, good news, we make hydrogen. Bad news is we've created a lot of CO2 as you do it. 
A second and new mechanism of creating hydrogen is the mechanism that we use at the Port of Long Beach, which I'm going to dig into here a little bit later. Um, and this is where we take methane and air in, and through an electrochemical process, not combustion, we create hydrogen plus CO2. The CO2 then is left in a very concentrated fashion that can be easily captured. Um, in addition to making hydrogen, this process also creates electricity and it creates water. So it's uh, it's it's quite different from the, the direct process on the left, because in addition to getting hydrogen, you're getting electricity and water, and you've got carbon uh, CO2 in a mechanism in which it can be easily captured. So that's the number one mechanism for making um, hydrogen today, direct process. The number two mechanism today is fusing electrolysis. So this is a fashion in which we are adding electricity plus um, water together, and we use that electricity to crack that water into hydrogen and oxygen. The good news is, is when you do that, you're not creating any new CO2. However, depending upon what kind of electricity you put in, it may have resulted in CO2. So for example, if you're just going to use grid power, the grid today is comprised of a lot of coal, a lot of other things. So if you're going to use that to make hydrogen, you really can't count that as green hydrogen because there was a lot of carbon dioxide that was emitted in the creation of electricity. On the other hand, if you use green energy like wind and solar or nuclear, you could end up with a scenario in which you are going to create zero carbon hydrogen out the other side. Um, there are, uh, I highlighted three technologies today. Um, one is very mature, that's the alkaline technology. Um, it's been around for decades, it's well understood. The challenge with that, with, with that kind of technology is that it's only 70% efficient, which means if you look at the electricity that you go into it, and if you look at the energy that's resulting in the hydrogen that's left, you've lost 30%. If you're using grid energy, that's a big loss. It only, you know, it already takes four acres to make one megawatt of solar. Um, and that one megawatt of solar is only operating on average 25% of the time because it's not light all the time. And now if you're going to throw another 30% of that away in this transition hydrogen, you are losing and using a ton of renewable energy to create this little bit of hydrogen. Um, on the far right is the kind of um, innovation that's that, that that's causing um, a, kind of a lot of stir in the markets today, and that's solid oxide. And the, the real key difference there is that it's much more efficient. So solid electrolysis can be between 90 and 100% efficient. Uh, and what that means simply is, is that if you're going to think about using electrolysis um, and you're going to use green energy to do it, you want to waste as little as that possible. So there's a lot of um, a lot of momentum around solid oxide electrolysis. Uh, and I'll be talking just a bit about that here in 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 just a little bit. Uh, PEM uh, polymembrane in the middle um, is is uh, as you can see, it's kind of got that medium. Uh, there, there's some you know there's some advantages to how fast it can scale um, and move up and down, uh, but it kind of has that medium type efficiency. So there's, uh, there's certain use cases where where that might make sense as well. So you might hear the color of hydrogen. Um, I'll, I'll let you study this afterwards. But basically, the color of hydrogen is dependent upon where the energy, where you know, what kind of where you got it from, what kind of electricity went into it. So, um, you know, for example, if we're going to take grid electricity into something and, um, you know, we are, at, how, how green is it? Is it solar? Is it wind? In which case it might go right to green. Maybe we're going to use a natural gas that creates that electricity, but we're going to capture carbon during the um, uh, you know during the process. And so in that case, in, you might have something called blue hydrogen, where you're creating hydrogen, um, uh, but you're capturing the CO2. At the end of the day, these colors come down to carbon intensity. Uh, and in truth, most of us in the industry are trying to get rid of these colors because they, they kind of don't make any sense. It really should just come down to how carbon intense the hydrogen is. There's really, you know, why should nuclear energy be called pink and not green? You know, who knows? Um, but at the end of the day, you're going to start to see carbon intensity. And in fact, um, this new legislation, the Inflation Reduction Act, and that 45V policy doesn't talk about color. It talks about carbon intensity. And the subsidy you get is a function of how little carbon you're using from zero up to some threshold. Hydrogen uh, is extremely important. This, the final slide kind of on hydrogen energy care. I just talked about this idea. If we take electricity, 
and we bring it together with water, electrolysis happens, we can create hydrogen, but we can take it another way to think about it. You can, on the left, you can start with that methane and um, we can use that direct process like steam methane reformation. We can create hydrogen that direction. Of course, it might be gray or blue, or we can combust that methane and create electricity. So this, you can see how, kind of how this hydrogen water and, and fossil fuels are all kind of directly connected, but we can take it even farther. And that is that we've developed processes to use um, synthetic hydrogen to create synthetic ammonia. So we can, this process called the Haber-Bosch process, in which case uh, we use uh, hydrogen combined with air and you create uh, uh, ammonia. Of course, ammonia and water are what goes to create food. One more process, a process called the fischer tropsch process. In this case, we could use hydrogen that we created, green hydrogen that we created, and we could use CO2 that is captured from power gen. So it would be captured CO2 plus hydrogen and use this process to create synthetic fuel. So when people talk about synthetic aviation fuel, this is one mechanism. There's several ways to get there, but this is one mechanism by which they go to do that. So the real illustration being here is that, that food, water, electricity, synthetic fuels, this is one ecosystem. And people in the space are really playing around different elements of these processes to focus on how do I think about greening aviation? How do I think about greening you know, fertilizer? How do I think about greening electricity? You'll see the same technology and the same people playing in each of these spaces because they are interrelated. So let's talk about who we are. Um, uh, Fuel Cell Energy, clean tech company, uh, uh, we were founded in 1969, uh, publicly traded, uh, and really have two things that we focus on, and that's on the right, decarbonize power and producing hydrogen. Uh, and I'll dig into what some of those are, but, but what you're really going to see is that, think about that value chain we just talked about, is how do we apply electrochemistry to go and facilitate some of this transition? How can we make lower carbon hydrogen? How can we make lower carbon power? How can we decarbonize these things that are out in the world today already making power? How can we use hydrogen to create long duration storage? These are all the challenges and opportunities that you know keeps me up at night thinking about. Um, headquartered here in the US, it's important, uh, some of those carrots and sticks, especially around the Inflation Reduction Act and hydrogen hubs and all these things, uh, manufacturing in the US matters using union labor matters, um, using U.S. steel matters. So we focus around all these things to really make sure we're able to capture these kind of incentives um, as, as we look at the market. We do operate, though, um, uh, across multiple continents. Um, we've got manufacturing in Canada. We've got manufacturing and assembly in Europe. And our largest, uh, actually, our largest fleet is in Asia. Uh, so we've got a services activity in Korea. Uh, if you look at Fundamentally, what we do and how our platforms, we focus on two electrical electrochemical platforms. One is called a molten carbonate platform. That's that, pl that white platform that, that you can see on the illustration below. The blue platform is our solid oxide platform. They're flexible electrochemistry platforms. They can be used across all the spectrum. Um, so they can be used to create power, to be the kind of the nucleus of a microgrid. They can be used to create hydrogen and they can be used to actually capture CO2 and destroy nitrous oxide from other power sources as well. So I'll dig into that here just on a few slides as we go. So first of all, let's talk about power generation. Um, both of these platforms are capable of power generation. You can see there's two different sizes. Um, the carbonate platform, the smallest brick there is 1.4 megawatts. Solid oxide, um, smallest brick is 250 kW. Um, it, beyond the scope of our short conversation today, but these are both extremely efficient platforms. So especially the, the solid oxide platform, those efficiencies that you see there are at or above the efficiencies of the largest gas generators in the world. A typical small gas generator that would be in a facility, its efficiency would be in the high 30s. Uh, so you can see how much more efficient we're talking. Uh, also thinking about, can these platforms use hydrogen as a feedstock? Instead of natural gas, can we feed hydrogen in? 
the molten carbonate platform, we can bring in up to we can bring um, use hydrogen as up to fifty percent of the feedstock um, without degrading its outputs. Solid oxide can take one hundred percent hydrogen as an input without taking its output. So, in those scenarios, creating electricity with a low carbon footprint. I'll let you read all these quick things later. But because we're not combusting fuel, we don't emit those. Um, you know, uh, th those criteria emittance uh, to the levels that are required. Uh, so think about those particulates and that SOX and NOx and carbon monoxide and lead and those things. We're able to, because of that, because we, we emit only trace amounts of those things, we're, we're allowed to um, deploy these in, uh, and literally, uh, we've been able to deploy every zone we've ever tried to deploy them in, including some of the most strict air quality zones in the world. The other thing is, is they, they operate very quietly. A lot of times when you think about power generation, you think about a you know noisy engine or a noisy turbine or something. Um, there's literally no moving parts within the modules themselves. And the, the only moving parts are in the balance of plant. And those are just things like fans. So we could be having this, I could be doing this Zoom session from you know a 15 megawatt plant and you'd be able to hear me just fine. I want to have one illustration on this and um, and this is just a concept uh, I think that's important to, to think through. Um, when when you've got a facility and you think about greening it, a lot of times you want to jump right to wind and solar. And wind and solar have a great role to play. I'm not negative on them at all. I'm a huge proponent of both those two things. Um, and they do make, they can make zero carbon energy when they're operating. Of course, that's that second clause is where the challenge comes in because the typical capacity factor for solar in the U.S. is roughly 25 percent. The typical capacity factor for wind in the U.S. Uh, is typically 35 percent. And so what that means is that for, you know, somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of the time, you're not using a renewable energy asset, right? You're using, you have to use the grid. And the grid is a lot dirtier than what a decentralized fuel cell. So we like to say, hey, hang on a second. Look at your entire years of consumption and count the times when you're using the grid in addition to the times when you would be using grid and solar. And what you'll find if you do that is that you'll end up with a lower carbon footprint by using a fuel cell than you would by implementing wind and solar at your facility. The other challenge is space. And I don't have an illustration of it here, but uh, you know, a, a 2.8 megawatt fuel cell basically sits on a tennis court. 2.8 megawatts of solar would be 10 acres. So it's, you know, completely night and day in terms of space required. So energy intense, quiet, operating 24-7 ends up reducing your carbon footprint more than just simply putting some wind or solar there. So I say do both. Uh, put as much wind and solar in as you can, but uh, use this as a mechanism to green and clean up and you know, think about the rest of your, your power. Uh, when you think about hydrogen, in addition to, to using hydrogen as a fuel cell, you can also think about using hydrogen as a storage mechanism. So if we're using electrolysis to create hydrogen, if we're using maybe solar input to a, to an electrolyzer, to create hydrogen. And then later we're using that hydrogen to go and put power back on the grid. You can think of that as long duration storage. And in fact, it stacks up very well against lithium ion storage. And what you'll find is that for durations less than four hours, um, it's gonna make a lot of sense to use um, lithium ion. Uh, but when you start thinking about that four window and longer, four hour window and longer, Lithium ion does not scale very well. So you can think about all we're doing is creating hydrogen. We just need to store that hydrogen. Turns out you can store a whole bunch of hydrogen in a relatively small space. If you're using lithium ion, you just end up with more batteries, more batteries, more batteries, and it ends up being much more costly. So with hydrogen, uh, this is something where we think about storage, but we think about it for those longer time durations. So maybe you've got something where you want to run something all night long, you need 10 or 12 hours, um, a hydrogen-based solution is going to make a lot of sense there. So in this fashion, we're using our solid oxide platform to create the hydrogen in electrolysis mode. And then we're using the same platform to create power in fuel cell mode and just using that hydrogen storage there in the middle. 
Finally, uh, final topic, we got 15 minutes left, is this carbon capture and NOx destruction. Um, as we think about that other policy, the Good Neighbor and Clean Air Act, this is an example of using a molten carbonate fuel cell to do carbon capture. So in this case, we're using methane as a feedstock, so we're running off natural gas, but that instead of feeding our fuel cell air, we're feeding it flue gas from a coal plant or a natural gas power plant or from a boiler, um, you know, some other kind of sources. And through that electrochemical process, we can concentrate and capture up to 90% of the CO2 that was in that flue gas. We can choose to create hydrogen and if, if we want to and, and separate that out. We can choose to create water and we can create electricity. Uh, in addition to that, you'll see the note on the bottom, not only are we capturing up to 90% of the CO2 that's in that flue gas, but we're also destroying 70% of the NOx that's in the flue gas. So we've got a lot of people that are going to be subject to this good neighbor saying, hey, could I take the output from my furnace and bring it into your fuel cell? And could I use it then to destroy the NOx? And hey, if you can capture the CO2 and let me make green cement or green steel or green glass, that's even better. I, mean, I can get a premium for that. So the way we think about that, and this is a specific example we looked at for a coal plant, is that um, we get to count the value of the power that we create. So yes, of course, it costs money to go and put this platform in. You're going to spend money on any NOx destruction or carbon capture solution you put in. The difference that we do, though, is that because we create electricity, that electricity can be used to offset your bill. Or if you happen to be in some kind of wholesale market, um, or a market with a subsidy like California for a fuel cell, et cetera, you can sell that back on a specific tariff. So what that means is that your net cost of capture is subsidized by your power revenue. And what that means is that this can be the most attractive carbon capture mechanism uh, it, depending upon the scenario. And so we look at things like what's the grid price that you're avoiding? Um, you know, some of those things are what makes a difference. Are, are you in one of those? Uh, are you in one of those uh, good neighbor states, etc.? Uh, but this kind of solution is going to make a lot of sense. A lot of places. Um, you may have seen a press release that we did two weeks ago announcing that um, some longstanding work we've been doing with Exxon Mobil has finally reached FID, which basically means the project's moving ahead. Uh, and this is the culmination of ten years worth of work perfecting. Um, this technology in concert with ExxonMobil and really taking it out to the world now. So this is a, a new use case for this platform. It actually uses the same kind of electrochemistry, though, that we've had in the market for in excess of 20 years now. Finally, the last slide um, is uh, some of these concepts all coming together at a site that is now in full commercial operation. And this is the port of Long Beach. Um, very interesting use case. So we're using our molten carbon platform. We're using biogas as a feedstock. Why is that important? Because carbon intensity. This biogas actually has a negative carbon intensity. And I won't explain the mental gymnastics that it took to figure that out, but uh, you can trust your, your thankful uh, environmental energy lawyers who do that kind of thing for a living. But we take that as a feedstock. And with that, this one platform, we create 1,270 kilograms a day of hydrogen. Toyota is buying that hydrogen from us. They have um, a fuel cell electric vehicle. So that vehicle has a real little mini fuel cell inside of it. It uses that hydrogen to propel the car. Toyota has also partnered with Packard. So you might not know the name Packard, but you probably know the name Peterbilt and Kenworth. Those are two Packard brands. Toyota has partnered with them to put fuel cell in Packard trucks. So those two Kenworth trucks up there, are, I think there's 12 trucks they've now put in operation at the port that use hydrogen. They fill up at using the hydrogen that we make. Toyota also fills up their own vehicles, those Mirai fuel cell vehicles. They get shipped out everywhere else. You may have also noticed that ionized water is a byproduct of this process, which is really important in a place like California that already is in a water crisis. So the fact that we're creating 1,400 gallons of deionized water a day um, we use that. It's actually hot water. So we use it for their car wash operation. So as, as part of many ESG initiatives, there's water consumption as part of that. So this platform helps with water consumption as well. If you don't use it for car wash, sometimes we'll use it for cooling tower operations, use it for food processing. So there's a lot of uses for water. 
Uh, and finally, we're creating also 2.3 megawatts of power. Um, Toyota uses about 400 kW of that. And in doing so, they've now made it their first zero carbon port in the world. The other 1.9 megawatts are sent out to the grid. Um, Cal ISO, which is the wholesale market in California, has a, a feed-in tariff for a fuel cell. So we're providing 1.9 megawatts to Cal ISO, 24-7 negative CI score energy. One platform doing all these things. You go to our website, you can do a virtual tour, you can click around, it's kind of cool. Uh, and um, if you're serious and interest around this, you can actually go visit the site. It's in full operation now. And actually, I see we've got a question, so I'll let you read it, and then we'll open it up to other Q&A for the last 10 minutes. Lovely. Um, this one says, a uh, tough question that I hear a lot is, why are we seeing FCEL, FCEL shares drop? Oh, I'm sorry. That's your <laughs> Yeah, your shares drop to these super low levels while there are significant great projects like XOM, Long Beach, TriGen, and others in the news. What's holding the share prices back? You know, that's a that that's really a, a, a answer to a question that it's kind of beyond what what I can answer. Right, as a um, what I can focus on is is bringing great technology to market, to engaging customers, to focusing on the right geographies, to understanding, you know, what these policy carrots and sticks are, um, what we can do is really focus on those fundamentals. Um, my technical colleagues would say the same thing. You know, we we focus on getting the best technology, the best kind of partners to market. Share price itself, you know, I would say you're going to have to talk to a stock analyst around that versus, versus me. I focus on the right business fundamentals. Thank you, Mark. Any other questions before we close? Ooh, looks like one more came in. Um, what is Toyota saying about the first months on the platform? Well, we're making hydrogen, we're making power, um, and uh, the uh, it's connected to a shell filling station. The shell filling station was uh, was was just recently completed, and so we're delivering power to that or delivering a. Uh, fuel to the, the fueling station. Now, there's actually two fueling stations there. There's a private fueling station, Toyota, and then there's a um, then there's a commercially available fuel station. So that one's just being turned on. Uh, and uh, th there will be future, uh, I know that Toyota plans on uh, their own separate um, announcements and press around this. So I'd allow them to go speak for themselves around that, except that, you know, I'd just say that it's been a, a very, a very good partnership with Toyota. Uh, doing this. Uh, this is the plat first platform in the world to do this. And, um, you know, Toyota and the Port of Long Beach really, um, you know, being willing to embrace this kind of solution made them a great partner on this. And and we worked hard to be a good partner to them as well. And I think you're going to continue to see that manifested in, in good news around this platform, both from them and us and others. Great question. All right. Well, if that is everything in your presentation today, Mark, we truly thank you for your time and all of your insight. I especially thank everybody for taking the time to attend today. And this will be made available both via video and the slides also will be shared to with everybody who registered ahead. Um, you can find the recording also on our Facebook page. If you'd like to share it immediately, um, please go ahead and do so. So without any further ado, I really appreciate your time, Mark. Thank you, everybody. And our next one will be next month, the third Wednesday. And we will look forward to seeing everybody then. Yeah, thank you, everyone who attended. I appreciate it. Take care. Thank you, Mark. Bye. Bye.